The good news comes to us this morning from the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Hear this good news. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, and believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I would go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you will be also. And you know the way to the place that I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we possibly know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all of this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do not believe. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me, that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, and believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I say to you, one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if in my name, you ask me for anything, I will do it. Here ends the reading. May it be a blessing to our youth. And so, beloved in Christ, what of these words spoke to you? What left off the page? What caught your attention? What made you stand up straight? Or sit up straight? What words spoke to you? Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They say it all, don't they? Are there other words? I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. How often do we need to hear that reminder that God is ahead of us? I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So were there any words that really bothered you? Any words that you wish were not in this passage? to work over us. Because I love the Gospel of John. I mean, I love the Gospel of John. I love it so much that I want to make you love it. I want these words to jump off the page for you. I want you to be so excited about the power and meaning of these words because I love these words so much. 
And here again, as I've been preaching the past couple of weeks with you, we've deterred ourselves from the Gospel of Mark that usually guides our way on the Revised Common Lectionary. And we find ourselves here in the Gospel of John, preaching these words here again in this chapel, here with you. I've been reminded again of how much I love these words. Don't worry if you don't know what the Revised Common Lectionary is. That's not important. Just hear me say this. I love these words. I love the Gospel of John. It begins with the most fantastic poetry. And I bet you even know the very beginning of the poem. For it goes like this. In the beginning was the word. You know the rest. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And now we get to about this point in the Gospel where Jesus gets closer to death and he begins this lengthy speech, this long conversation with Philip and Thomas right here in about chapter 14. We get to this point and I want to give up, but I don't, and I wouldn't. I can't because these words speak to my understanding of the world. This strange coded language liberates the hope that I have for this world. It's a hope that I don't hear from politicians on TV or bloggers on the internet. It's a hope that I can only find revealed in these words in the Gospel of John. John's community is one that tried to live in the kingdom that Jesus started to build. Of course, unlike the other Gospels, the word kingdom is never mentioned. It's just what they did. For in their world, there was a dominant culture that was dictated by the empire of Rome. And then off to the side somewhere, there was this beloved community, John's community. Theirs was a community that didn't buy into the ways of the empire. They ignored social rank, privileges, and entitlement. They related to each other differently. They didn't totally remove themselves from the empire, but their decisions about how to relate to each other set them apart. It was in these relationships that they revealed their opposition to the ways of the empire. In other words, they were social deviants. You may not be as comfortable as that particular phrase as I am. You might think that's going a little too far. But listen, listen to Jesus' social deviance. As he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. This is a guy that doesn't fit comfortably into the mainstream. The empire of Rome describes one way of being militarily, economically, politically, and even ideologically. The empire has its own way of truth and life. But simply by his choice of words, Jesus shows that there's another way. Jesus rejects the ways of empire and corrects it by saying, I, I am the way and the truth and the life. He's speaking a particular language to a particular people in a particular way. And this is why I love the Gospel of John. For John uses language in cryptic and confusing ways, and yet, if we can just listen, just listen closely enough that those phrases open our troubled hearts, we might just hear an earth-shattering message message we most need to hear. These words don't require a dictionary. You don't have to look them up to figure out exactly what they are. They're ordinary words, which is what makes it so powerful. This community uses ordinary terms from ordinary language of the larger society, but gives them special in-group meanings that are understood only by the insiders. You and I are among those insiders, or that's the idea. That's what they're trying to be each and every time. That's what we are trying to be each and every time we show up on Sunday morning to praise the one who sent 
our way of the truth and the life. We continue this tradition of the beloved community simply by having the audacity to recite these words in worship. We continue to use particular words like truth, and life, and way to explain the unique way that we relate to one another. It is in our words that we find the power to oppose the empire, the way things are, the way that we think things should be. It's in these ordinary words that we begin to describe a different relationship to each other and to the world. Jesus offers three words that begin to imagine this possibility, this unique relationship. And they are those words that you spoke. The way, the truth, and the life. These are not new words for us or for John's community. They've been in the story all along. They are so very familiar. For the truth is what came through Jesus. That's how this wonderful poetry begins in the Gospel of John. The revelation of the Word becoming flesh is full of truth. Truth is what Jesus is. And this is the truth that bonds us together here in this beloved community. It is a bond that we find in words, words that we repeat to each other over and over again, in worship, in the women's circle, and even at vacation Bible camp. Words that offer, that we offer in our prayers of both joy and concern. Words that we repeat from ancient prayers and new hymns. We do this in our own way, with words. But for us, they are not just words, because words are never enough. No matter how much we try to mean what we say, we really rarely say what we mean. We want more than words. We want something beyond words. That which has flesh, full of truth. That's what we're too tongue-tied to say. That's what we're afraid to speak aloud because this is what matters most. In this beloved community, with Christians all over the world that are trying to live this faith, it is this that matters. How our words affirm our relationship to God, to Jesus Christ, and to each other. We dare to use our language in a particular way because we are particular people. We are claiming life in a world where we choose to believe that there is more truth that truth can have flesh, that truth can live among us, that it can be the very thing that bonds us together. And it is this that brings us hope. It is this that goes and makes us try to talk to each other, to understand each other, to try to relate to each other. But that's what we're seeking. That's what we want. We want the things that will make life. In all things, we seek life. Not violence or destruction, not erosion or devastation. We seek life for all creatures and all people. We seek life for our world. This is our way. Do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus says. There's plenty to outrage us, you know that very well. Then and now, there are plenty of things that anger us, that frustrate us, that make us want to hide under the covers and never, ever get out of bed. There's enough in this world that rejects both life and truth. Jesus knows this. And Jesus knows how hard it is to find a way around this. But these are words of poetry, friends. You're not supposed to hear these words and suddenly feel at ease about the ways of the world. That's not how poetry works. Your heart may, well, still be troubled, even though these words do something that only poetry can do. It's what Billy Collins tries to show his students. When he invites them into the world of poetry, he invites them to walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. 
or to water ski across the surface of a palm, waving at the author's name on the shore. But instead, his poetry students, well, all they want to do is to tie the poem to a chair with a rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. To every poetry student and every disciple, Jesus says, believe in me. Believe in God and believe also in me. For I am the way and the truth and the life. It's a non-answer, I'll give you that, which is probably why Thomas and Philip both appear baffled. Jesus doesn't answer our anger or our outrage any more than he answers theirs. He doesn't give them or us a solution. He doesn't tell us what to do. He doesn't answer all of our questions. And this is why I love the Gospel of John. For John uses <coughs> particular words in a particular way for particular people. And so he gives the disciples a bunch of words to remind them of their commitment. Commitment to God, to Jesus Christ, and to each other. Because it is this commitment to God, to Christ, and to each other that matters most. Matters most than any possible solution that we could imagine. What matters is that we are always bringing ourselves into the awareness that that commitment is what guides us. It's what moves us down the path. It's what forces us to make another step, for we are committed to God, to Christ, and to each other. When the now retired pastor, Richard Floyd, was just beginning to explore his commitment to faith in his confirmation journey when just a teenager, he and his fellow confirmands were asked what the third of the Ten Commandments means. The one that says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. He was asked in confirmation, what does this really mean? And as he recalled in the United Church of Christ daily devotional just a few weeks ago, a hand shot up. Swear, someone said. Well, yes, the seminarian leading that confirmation experience said, we should not use God's name inappropriately. But it means more than that. Can anyone guess? Nobody could. And then the seminarian added, it means not to use God's name lightly. In fact, it means not to take God lightly or for granted. Commitment to God, to Christ, and to each other means that we don't take any of this lightly. This is our commitment. We don't take Jesus' name for granted any more than we overlook the names that we choose for each other. This is what makes us social deviants. Others might take up a lot of hot air. They might sound better than we do. But in each word that we speak, we try to name our commitment to God, to Christ, and to each other. We are people of this way. We are guided by this truth. And we don't take it lightly. Because in these words are all of our hopes. There is truth. There is life. There is hope. It is why we are guided by this way with people daring to believe that our commitment to each other just might be all that we need. May it be so. Amen.